why do you think that there is so much shame and fear around the topic of sex, especially when it comes to women and sex? I definitely think that I would be remiss to not mention religion when it comes to fear, shame, and stigma. Um, America is one of the most religious countries in the world, despite us not necessarily thinking so, uh, with like the far right Christian propaganda that is embedded, unfortunately, in abstinence only education that is prominent in many, many schools across the US. That's where it starts, right? I think there are multiple ways that we learn about sex. Uh, one of which is like sex in the media, one of which is from our parents or at home, and the other is really what are we learning in school. And so when we're really young and we're being taught right away, like, oh, we have to separate the boys and the girls for period conversations. Like, that's so embarrassing to get your period. You know, there are all these messages that we receive from school. And also parents just generally aren't really equipped to, you know, teach their young kids about their body and proper body parts and names. And, you know, same same thing there when we're receiving the messages that you shouldn't call your vulva your vulva and you should call it your hoo-ha or you should call your penis your pee-pee, right? Like these messages ignite a lot of shame and fear. Um, but as you mentioned, specifically a lot of shame and fear for women and for people with vulvas. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned that thing about naming because that's, so I have a three-year-old daughter and, you know, I've spoken to a lot of sex educators and there's a lot of conversation around like age appropriate um, conversations with children, which I definitely want to get into with you. But yeah, I mean, we're very like we call like her vagina vagina. I don't make up names for it. Um, but it's been kind of interesting to see like how my husband can be sort of uncomfortable around that stuff, I think, because she's a girl and he doesn't really know. And um but I, I personally do feel like that's that's important because there's been like studies that have shown that that children who learn about their body parts without shame and who learn the appropriate names for it are like less likely to be targeted for like sexual assaults that's or right. molestation later on, right? Because they kind of understand these things. And I remember one thing that was really interesting was when I took her to the, my daughter to the gynecologist gynecologist well it was a pediatrician and mm -hmm. you know we had to look at her vagina and the the pediatrician said to her and I thought this was really smart she said so I'm gonna you know take a look and it's okay because I'm a grown-up and mommy's in the room with me so mm -hmm. it's okay for me to do this and I was like that's actually like a good distinction to make like it's you're not alone it's not like a secret like there's a supervisor here that is trusted um, I don't know. I just kind of thought, oh, okay, that's that's a smart thing to say. So totally. I definitely want to talk about you and, and sex education with youth. Like, and this is something that parents really struggle with. How do you know what is the age appropriate conversation to have with your kids when? Yeah, I think this is a really common question. Um, the hosts of the Puberty Podcast um, are really, really wonderful and actually just wrote a book on this. I believe it's called This Is So Awkward or something like that. Uh, but I've, I've chatted with them on my podcast and I've been on their podcast. And something that they say as, uh, as parents and as experts in the field is like, whatever your kids are asking you, like, you need to be prepared to figure out like, hey, what's the motivation behind what they're asking? And are they really wanting to know? Or is it something else that might be coming up for them? And what is the way that you can tell them the truth in a way that they will understand? And so I think like there's that piece, which is like when your kids are asking, that is a perfectly appropriate time to answer their questions. And if you don't know the answer, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, that's a really good question. I'm going to do some research and let's talk about this tomorrow because kids know when you're bullshitting them, right? Like they mm -hmm. know when something is off. And so depending on how old the kid is, usually, you know, if the kid is five years old and they're saying, where do babies come from, right? Do you need to launch into a 20 minute thing about the sperm and the egg? Like, Probably not. They might not understand that, right? But if they're in middle school and they're asking that, you can gauge whether or not your student or your kid is able to appropriately understand the information that you're giving them. 
But the answer to that question that I always have in terms of when is it appropriate to start having conversations with your kid is when they can talk, <laughs> like when they can, you know, basically like from zero to however old they are, right? Because there's always something that you can be saying, whether that be here's the age appropriate, you know, thing that I'm going to talk about when it comes to the name of your nipple or your vulva or your penis, right? Like that is a conversation about anatomy, right? Whether they're four years old and a relative comes over and says something along the lines of, oh, I'm so sad because you're not giving me a hug, right? Like that's a perfect opportunity to say to your kid, like, hey, it's okay. Like if you want to set that boundary, that's your body and you're allowed to not hug that person, right? Like there are all sorts of kind of things. Um, Another example for young kids is sharing, right? Like you may not think that sharing and friendship or conversations that happen in sex ed or in health education, but they totally are when we're talking about healthy relationships and again, how to set boundaries or how to be kind to other people um, or how to express your needs. Like all of those things fall under the category of health education. And then of course, when we're moving along, when 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 the kid or the student gets older, we should be telling them information about themselves and their experiences before those things happen. So they're not so scary, right? So for example, if you have a so a kid who identifies as a girl and they're going to get their period soon, right? Like seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, like that's an appropriate time to be like, hey, in like a year or two, you might get a period and this is what a period is. And like half the world gets them and sometimes they suck and that's okay. And there are ways that we can, you know, manage it or whatever your your method is. Um, the last thing I want to say on this though, like tone and the way in which you go about talking to your kids is everything. Kids remember, right? And so when you are chatting with your kids, if you show that you're afraid and you're ashamed, they will totally pick that up. And that is the main thing that they will remember. So it's really important for parents to actually practice conversations, whether that be with their friends or with their partner, before they have them with their kid, if they feel like this is not their forte and they're not very good at it. Because being a sex positive parent and a supportive parent, that's all the kid wants ultimately. If you don't know the answer to their questions, as long as you're supportive and you tell them like, hey, I love you no matter what and I'm going to get you the information and the resources that you need because you deserve that and you're a person who should be happy and healthy. So I think like the tone and like the context and the way that you talk to your kid is really important. Hello, my amazing listeners. You know how much I love bringing this podcast to your ears every week. So if you're looking a way to support the show and get some fantastic perks, I've got just the thing, my Patreon page. With plans starting at just $5 a month, you can be part of our exclusive community. Your support not only helps to keep this podcast going, but it also unlocks some really cool bonuses. Imagine getting access to the live streams of my interviews as they happen. You'll be right in the middle of the action, seeing all of the unedited moments. But that's not all. As a Patreon member, you'll also get exclusive bonus content. I'm talking extra mini episodes where our guests answer questions submitted by you. Plus, you'll have access to my fine art photography and behind the scenes videos, giving you a sneak peek into my creative process. And guess what? If you opt for a discounted year-long membership, you'll save even more while supporting the show. Longtime subscribers even get free HRU merchandise as a token of my gratitude. So want to join us? Head over to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered and become a part of our growing community. Your support means the world to me. Let's make this podcast even better.